good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another thrilling broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you joined us yesterday, you'll know we are in the midst of an epic new series in conjunction with our amazing friends at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. It is National Wildlife Week, so we wanted to celebrate with you by bringing in some top-tier amazing scientists and conservationists to share stories of some of the amazing work that the CWF is doing to protect ecosystems, habitats, and species coast to coast to coast across Canada. We did bats yesterday with James Paget. We've got whales, turtles, and grassland birds to come. But today, you are smack dab in the middle as a gigantic audience for the biggest one of them all. We have almost 1,100 kids from six provinces, four U.S. states, um, all across North America. So a huge welcome to all of you for joining us. Um, I'm so, so excited to dive in in just a minute with our topic du jour. A few quick housekeeping notes. We are going to have so many amazing resources to keep the learning going when we are done. So if you want to learn about species, about the education work, conservation work the Canadian Wildlife Federation is doing, we're going to get all that to you in your inbox when you're done. So stay tuned for all of that. This program, like all of our others, is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch this in three weeks or three years down the road, you can head right there and do just that. Lots of opportunity to keep the learning going. And most excitingly for many of you, we're going to be doing a Kahoot together. So between our talk and our Q&A, a little four-question quiz to have some fun, test your understanding. So if you want to pull up Kahoot.it with that game pin below, we'll be doing that in about 25 minutes. But I'm so thrilled today to welcome in Tracy Outwell. She's going to take us on a little journey about pollinators butterflies, bees, and more, all the amazing work that the CWF does to protect them and to help the public and kids like you understand more about these really incredible creatures. Pollinators is one of the most fascinating topics to our audience for years now. It's why we have 1,100 of you in today. So I'm so excited to bring you in uh, and, and bring Tracy in to blow our minds over the next 25 minutes. Tracy, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to the broadcast. Thanks, Jesse. Just want to say hi to all the kids in all the classrooms across Canada. It's great to have you here. Uh, my name is Tracy Atwell, and I'm a restoration ecologist, but I work with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. And um, I'm going to be talking about pollinators, which you might not have thought of as wildlife, but they are wildlife. There are small creatures that we don't always notice and pay attention, but they're very important. Outstanding. Oh, you're good to go. And, and it, the presentation is working. Tracy and I went on an epic Great. journey together for 15 minutes before we went live to get the presentation all up and running, but it is, it's doing great. We're good to go. <laughs> Okay, so start off with a little quiz here for you. So um, all of you kids put your thinking caps on and see which answer you think is the correct answer. What is a pollinator? Is it an insect who, who moves me nectar and pollen from plants? Is it bats and insects who move nectar and pollen from plants? Is it birds, bats, and insects who move pollen and nectar from plants? So feel free to jump in the chat box there and let me know what you think the answer is. What do we think? Hello, YouTubers. Feel free to chime in the chat through the entire broadcast, by the way. We'd love to take your questions there. Miss Fisher's class, welcome in live. Um, so yes, I, I think the one uniting factor is certainly that we are moving nectar and pollen from plants, Tracy, which is very exciting. Uh, our YouTubers are saying, see, birds, bats, and insects. I think they might have something with that. That's very good. All right. Yeah. But a smart group here. So basically, yeah, all three of these groups are nectar and pollinator um, they move the nectar and the pollen from plants. Um, in Canada, we don't have any bats who are pollinators. So you might have heard about bats, particularly in the States, with, that move uh, that uh, around. But that, for Canada, it's more birds and insects that are pollinators. So just to give you an idea, this is sort of a little concept of all of our native pollinators. So that includes a number of groups you might not have thought about before. So it includes all the beetles. It includes flies. And a lot of these flies look like bees, so they trick us and we think they're actually bees, but they're not. We have all the bees, of course, with the big fat fuzzy bumblebees you might have seen and a bunch of other native bees as well. We have wasps, everyone's favorite, <laughs> and lots of moths that people uh, might not notice because sometimes they're very active at night and we don't always see them. And then, of course, butterflies, which are with our monarch butterfly. So they're all together on the bus. So it's the concept of they're all in the same habitat. They're all doing a similar job and they all are important. So just some pretty pictures to show you. So these again are all pollinators. They look different, they have colors, they have different shapes, but they're all important. So just a slide to show you about uh, the importance of all these creatures. So one in three bites of food that we eat are the result of animal assisted pollination. So livestock need to uh, graze on alfalfa and clover that's pollinated. Bees keep our agriculture buzzing. So honey, fruits, all kinds of things that you might not have thought of. 
And also even pollinators assist in making of uh, fibers, such as cotton and flax for your t-shirt. And many animals depend on the fruit nuts and seeds produced by insect pollination. And we also get a lot of our insect pollinated foods for nutrients like vitamin E for our diet. And we also love the flowering plants and how much beauty they bring to our world. So big question, why do we care about pollinators? See if anyone can throw in the chat box what they think is a good reason to care about pollinators. Ooh, I mean, I certainly care about pollinators personally, because I find that, I mean, among other things, and this is something we talked about in James's program yesterday, all animals are inherently valuable. I love having a garden full of butterflies and bees. Uh, honestly, our crocuses just opened the other day and the fact that we had bees around them was cause for literal jumps for joy. So very exciting for that. But if anyone else wants to chime in with any reasons pollinators are important, um, got a little message about food, keeping our food around or keeping it healthy, uh, helping it grow, so things like that. They make honey. That's a great answer, guys, or a burn class. Uh, no pollinators, no life. We like food. I think they're on the ball. Tracy, this is a good group. <laughs> Agreed. Okay. So just to show you some pretty pictures of all the different food crops that need uh, our pollinators. So almonds, artichokes, pears, avocado, apples, kiwis, my favorite, chocolate, uh, Brussels sprouts, we may not be your favorite, uh, blackberries, cherries, and this is just a small list. So imagine all the foods we wouldn't have if we didn't have pollinators. So this is a little trick question for you next year. So what is a wild bee? So we talk about um, native bees a lot. So have a look through those pictures and see if you can think and recognize which one is a wild bee versus a honey bee. Hmm. And you don't want to chime in. And I mean, I know there's a lot here, mm. but if there's any that jump out as wild bees. By the way, I will note because we're getting some commentary for it on YouTube. We know that there's a weird text box on the screen. We tried so hard to get rid of that. We we smacked the computer. We told it. We prayed with it a little bit, and it refused to cooperate. So now you get to know a cool thing about plant traits mediating agroecological outcomes. <laughs> that is your lesson for the day. Bonus lesson in the pollinator broadcast. Right, yes. yeah. Um. I think you might have confuzzled the mason. Oh, we got people no noting mason bees in your bee thing. Green bees might be the wild ones. These are great, Aunt Tracy. We got the best bee crew of all time. I know. And just to take a note to all the different colors and variations and, and the beauty in all the different patterns of all these uh, different bees. So just to show you, these are all wild bees. So people naturally think about honeybees, and yes, they have a role, but they're actually considered livestock. So they come from afar. They're not native to Canada, and of course they provide honey, which is a great reason. But people forget and or don't even know about all these other native bees. We have like 400 species of native bees in Canada, and they're out there doing their thing, and we may, may never even notice them because they're so small and they don't really bother us much. So I just talked about this. So honeybee is not a wild bee. So um, yes, it's important, but not what we really need to focus on. So what do you think pollinators need to carry out their life cycle? Throw something in the chat if you have any ideas. I'll give a hint to anyone. And we, we do have some audience that were here for James's program the other day. There is sort of a uniting factor for all wildlife. It doesn't matter if you're a pollinator or a bat or whales. It might be... I mean, I'm sitting in one right now, not a chair, not an office. You need homes of some kind, so habitats of some kind. Um, if anyone else wants to chime in, we're getting a lot of great queries in. You guys are a fantastic audience. Pollen, pollinators need pollen. That's very good. Uh, need honey from a, a miss, someone in Miss Wandy's class. Water, food, safe nesting sites. You guys are awesome. Tracy, take us away. <laughs> yeah, so just to give you some ideas of different things. So obviously lots of beautiful flowers and that can be trees and shrubs and flowers that grow on the ground. Um, also water. So we need ponds and lakes and even little puddling areas where they can collect a little moisture here and there. A big one that we don't often think about is bare ground. So as I'll show you, there's some bees that need that bare ground for nesting. So we don't always need to fill like our gardens with every single space of bare ground doesn't need to be covered. Uh, leaf litter, we're gonna talk about that a bit too. And fallen plant debris are all important things for pollinators. So of course the three categories of food, water and shelter, very important. And then food for all seasons. So 
this might be not be something you think about because you have food all year round. But these, this is a list of native species that are found in the Ottawa area on the left-hand side. And you can see there's different uh, columns that tell you what months that they bloom in. So those are the only seasons that those pollinators can visit, say, common milkweed and find nectar and pollen would be in July and August. And this short shows you also the different colors. So there's a different debate about vision in pollinators and what colors they can see. But in the end, it's all about diversity. So the more colors, the more variation, the better off the pollinators are going to be. So basically, they're very busy between July, August, September, and October trying to find those uh, flowering plants to finish their life cycle. And then, of course, breeding habitats. So this was something that I learned not too long ago about the different groups of native bees. So they have different life cycle breeding habitat. So 70% of them are ground nesting bees. So as I mentioned before, they need that bare ground to dig in and lay their eggs. So that's very important. Also stem or wood nesting bees. So basically having uh, dead stalks in a natural area in your garden provides a place for those bees to crawl inside and lay their larva, which I think is fascinating. And then there's cavity nesting bees. So mostly the uh, bumblebees, they actually create a, a cavity and they lay a whole bunch of eggs as you can see in that picture. So that's a smaller group, but uh, they're also doing their, carrying out their breeding habitat in that way. So here's a really cool picture on the left, again, of the bumblebee. You can see all those little orange uh, pods. Each of those is, is a baby bumblebee that's going to crawl out and uh, continue its life cycle. And then on the right is a close-up of what I was saying about the stems. You can see those yellow little wiggly, warm-like things. So those are the larvae of a bee that's going to grow up and mature and become an adult bee. So little, little tiny things that we might not even think to look for, and they're there. So what can we do to help the pollinators? So something we're working on at CWF is restoring meadows habitats full of wildfires. So as I mentioned, the wildfires are very, very important. Um, so we're trying to work with different partners, uh, roadsides, uh, power lines, different places where we can put wildfires and support all those pollinators. And the idea is if we can do that across the whole entire landscape, then the pollinators can find whatever resources they need at different points in time. I'm going to show you a little video. Hopefully this will play. Just wanted to note, Tracy, I'm sorry if this is supposed to be having sound, the sound is not coming through, but we are seeing it all, of course. Okay, that's all right. It's just music. <laughs> we can always share the link for that as well after if you wanted to watch it again. Perfect. So, yeah, so the point is basically all these human spaces that we create for roads, for power lines, things like that, where they have to do maintenance anyways. They can't have trees because it interferes with the power line and safety issues. So these are places that we call win-win, where we can put that wildfire habitat back in the environment. So just to give you an example here, so here is uh, some in this uh, upper left-hand corner, you can see a bin of our mix. So we create a wildflower mix of seed that has about 20 different species of wildflowers and a few grasses. And then we get out and we seed these areas like you see in the right-hand side. So over time, these uh, areas will grow up into big meadows like you see in the lower right-hand side. Uh, beautiful color and supports all the different pollinators. And then on the left, this is sort of a roadside project we did, and this was the first year, and you see the beautiful brown-eyed Susans. And if you look really closely, there is a goldenrod soldier beetle who has already found that flower in the first year, which is pretty exciting. 
So something else we do is a lot of uh, pollinator scorecard stuff. So whenever you do science, you're always looking to monitor and measure how effective you are. So that's part of my job is I get to go out and look at these sites and evaluate them and see how many pollinators are using the site, how many plants are growing and learn from that. And then I also have my colleague, uh, Gilles Miranda, who is the entomologist and he goes out and he does uh, surveys on what pollinators are actually in the site. So we can learn over time what's the best uh, sites for the pollinators. So here's another little video for you. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to play for sound, Jesse. You'll have to let me know here. Can you hear that? We heard the tiniest little bit of something and then it went away. <laughs> I'm sorry the setup's a little finicky. That happens sometimes, but we do have a little no bee in the vial, so we're catching a bee. Yeah, I'll just animate this for you a bit. So you'll see up in the left-hand side, uh, Gilles got his net there. So that's his tool of the trade. And he goes out into the sites where there's uh, been restoration happening. You can see the golden rod in the back. So this would have been in August. And then he collects the little bugs and he puts them in his little tube. And uh, he, if he can identify it, then he will record what species he has and release it. If not, he takes it back to the lab to ID it. And then he keeps track of all the different species he finds in the different areas. So kind of a very specialized uh, scientist for sure. Oops, one back. Okay, so time for another quiz for you guys. So I may have hinted at the species earlier, but we see upper in the left, upper left corner, we see some white drops that kind of look a bit like glue. In the middle, we have a caterpillar. And then on the right, we have a cocoon. And then lower left, we have something emerging from that cocoon. And I'm wondering if anybody can tell me what species this is. I'm guessing that our audience today, with their being on the ball, are going to know this species lickety split. I grew up in Toronto. We had these around all the time. Uh, our first group, O'Burn class, you guys are so on the ball. Monarch butterfly, a Miss Cork's group. Monarch, 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 everyone at Girlsmith. Thank you guys so much. They, they know, Tracy. They know. It's amazing. Great. That's awesome. Yeah, and just to let you know, there is one species that always tricks me in the field, and it's called a viceroy butterfly. And uh, if you ever look at the picture, it's very tricky. It looks a lot like the monarch butterfly. It's orange and black as well, but there's few little tricks on telling the difference. So that would be a homework assignment for you to go and look and see if you can tell the difference. So obviously, um, milk monarch butterfly is very important in Canada. It's one of our migratory butterflies. It's uh, on the decline. We're a bit worried about the population. So we do know that it's very reliant on common milkweed as, as well as a variety of uh, other milkweed species. So this is a cool little graphic just to show you all the different species of milkweed in Canada. We actually have 14. So I'm just showing you one page of this document. Um, but I'm wondering if you can go look at your column where what province you are in and tell me what species you might have in that province. You can pop that in the chat box. And I apologize to our American viewers, <laughs> but you could probably do a Google search and find out what milkweed species are local to your state as well. Yeah. I know we did um, in my schools and milkweed planting things when I was a kid. And I know it's become more and more popular, which is really exciting um, over the last few years. And again, we're going to get a whole bunch of education resources to all our classes at the end of this. So if you are keen uh, to follow up and learn more about pollinators, now you can help. Don't worry, there will be lots of opportunity to do so. Uh, thanks for our folks in the, the chat um, for, for chiming in with which uh, milkweed species are yours. We've got some classes mentioning that Ontario has a lot. They certainly do. All the milkweed species. <laughs> yeah, so Ontario and Quebec is actually considered the prime range for the migratory monarch butterfly in Canada. And we think that is because there's so much of, of the milkweed around. Um, so it, it is seen in other places to the west, uh, but it's harder to see and not as common. So, yeah, the point of this is that milkweed comes in lots of different colors and shapes and varieties. Um, and so it's important to plant the variety of milkweed that is common to your area that supports the, the monarch as well as all the other pollinators that are in the area. So I'm gonna show you a cool little video. Maybe some of these people have, uh, these kids have already seen this, but this is kind of a cool video about what happens when these monarchs fly over 4,000 kilometers to Mexico. Okay. Nope. 
Okay. Well, the YouTube link is there, so I'm going to get Jesse to send I'll, that out. I'll get this to the classes. Well. Yeah, Tracy, I'm sorry it's being finicky, but I'll make sure all our classes have the Monarch Forum video at the end, and I'll get it in the chat as soon as I can. Yeah, and it's just a very cool thing when they fly all the way through the three countries, through Canada to the U.S., through the, to Mexico, and they all find this one little home all together in this grove of trees, and they spend their entire winter there. And there's lots of questions like, how do they figure that out? Like, how do they know which way to go? How do they find their buddies? Uh, it's, it's quite um, an interesting uh, biological question to understand. So, and then we want to talk about other species too. So we always talk about birds and things like that. But I'm wondering if you could throw in the chat a couple other species that you can find in this graphic that we would find in a meadow that would support pollinators. Ooh, I mean, I'm going to take the big one, ruby-throated hummingbird, which if anyone gets a chance to see a <laughs> ruby-throated hummingbird in their life, they should. It's like a magic bird. It's so, so cool. I love them so much. Uh, but yeah, feel free to chime in. And I just got in the Monarch Forum video into the YouTube chat. I will email all our registered classes with this, and Miss Fisher, I'll get it to you in StreamYard as well. Uh, what do we got? Dragonflies being noted, our, our ladybug, our, what do we got? Swallowtail butterfly, also an incredible creature. So they've got them. They're, they're, it's a great picture. <laughs> right. And you can see all the little tiny things too, you know, like the little snail at the bottom and the garden beetle and spittle bug and all the eggs that he just laid in the grass there. And even the life underground, right? You've got earthworms, you've got nematodes, all kinds of things. So it's the whole connection of the food web to all the creatures. And so to talk about what you can do to help pollinators, this is something I learned about a couple of years ago and that um, we, we talked about bumblebee queens um, using open ground, so they also overwinter underground. So they find a little hole and they wiggle in there and they spend the winter under there. So the leaves combined with the snow on top uh, keeps them well insulated and keeps them just warm enough to survive our, our cold winters. So, of course, in the spring, this time of year, everyone wants to clean up and they want spring to begin and they want to start gardening and things like that. Um, but we encourage people to leave those leaves um, and don't feel the need to get in there and clean everything up right away because that can harm the uh, pollinators before they've actually come out of their nests in May. So if you can hold off to June to start doing yard cleanup, uh, that's a great thing to do to help them survive those last months before they emerge. And so a bunch of other things that you can think about to do helping to pollinators is uh, plant native gardens at your school. Wherever you've got a little space, it doesn't have to be big. Find out what native plants are in your area and, and plant them. And a lot of our native plants grow really well. They're adapted to our environment and they're going to support all kinds of different pollinators. So second thing, talk to your parents about growing native plants and try to encourage them to not use sprays when they can because some of these sprays have uh, impacts on our pollinators and we want to try to avoid that if possible. Uh, something else, learn about insects and native plants that live in your area. I already kind of mentioned native plants. Uh, this one, get your bee glasses on. So use your imagination and start looking for those small little creatures that may be digging in the ground or visiting flowers and uh, just get a chance to admire how beautiful they are. Participate in citizen science programs. So one we support is something called iNaturalist. So it's an app you can load either on a tablet or a phone, and then you can go out and take pictures and it will tell you what species you're looking at. And then you can submit it and then it's contributing to science where researchers will go and then pull up all the different uh, species that are found in different places and they can study them, which is really cool. Uh, leave standing stalks in your yard. So again, as I talked about, a lot of the um, shrubs and sort of woodier species are a great place for the bees to lay their egg. And then salt licks. You can create a little space, like a very shallow disc, disc with uh, water and a little bit of salt, and it allows them to land, not drown, and get that little bit of water and salt that they need for their life cycle. And a new one that's just come out, uh, turning off your outdoor lights at night. So there's some new research that monarchs can be disrupted by lights at night, as well as um, fireflies and another, a number of other bugs and bees. So if you can encourage your parents to turn the lights off at night, that would be great. Even just had a motion sensor so that if there was something they needed to see, that it could be lit up. Um, at age 15, we have a great program. It's a wild outside program. It's a very like nature oriented program. Um, and my big plug is go to school, become an entomologist, a botanist, or an ecologist. We need lots of, of scientists to do this kind of work with ecology. 
And then I just wanted to share you with you my very favorite bee, which is the gypsy cuckoo bee. I call this the lazy bee. So it doesn't like to actually raise its own, its own offspring. So it goes into someone else's nest, lays its eggs, and then lets them do all the hard work, which I think is kind of funny. And then that's my uh, end of my spiel, my last slide, and a bunch of resources that I'm sure Jesse's going to share around. I uh, sure and sure. and to follow your advice for the first time in a broadcast ever, I flicked off the lights around me, so it sort of looks like I'm in a cave now. But we're saving some power <laughs> to help our pollinator friends. There we go. This is me in my natural dark element, everybody. Um, Tracy, if you want to come out of screen share and join us again, uh, we'll dive in with our Kahoot in a minute. I wanted to make a special plug for Backyard Bio. This is coming up in May, and this uses the iNatural app that Tracy mentioned, which is an amazing tool for exploring your local school grounds, backyards, all this good stuff. So check out backyardbio.net. We're going to get kids all around the world going out to find pollinators and more. But first, we're going to dive in with our Kahoot together. You guys have been such an engaged audience, so thank you so much for being so on the ball and excited today. Uh, we're going to dive in with our Kahoot. Four quick questions, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun, and then we're going to dive in with questions. So Ms. Fisher's class live, all our YouTube groups from all over North America. We can't wait to have you in. Um, I'm pulling up the Kahoot, and as I'm pulling it up, I'll say two other quick things. The faster you answer, the more points you get. And what you win is Tracy and I's everlasting respect, which is pretty cool. So just <laughs> keep that in mind. We will forever be uh, amazed at your incredible knowledge for winning this Kahoot. And with that, we will dive in. Do you want to give us little hints to any of these questions in the final seconds before they, uh, they wrap up? Uh, we'd love to have your insight. But here we go. Three, two, one. Question one. How many types of bees are there? So we showed quite a few today. We showed Tracy's favorite one at the end, but total in the world, is it 50, 500, 5,000, or 20,000? How many kinds of bee are there in the world? We didn't cover this specifically. I just wanted to get your thoughts. And if you've ever done a Kahoot with me before, it's usually a big number. It might play into <laughs> the, the answer here. Yeah, there's like very few, you got this 20,000 plus bees. So mammals like us, hairy things, antelope, bats, there's only like a thousand bats in the world. There are way more bees, kinds of bees, than there are all the mammals in the world, which is crazy. So way to go, groovy dog, taking our lead. All right, question two, might be a little more on the nose. Many monarchs undertake epic cross-continental migrations to overwinter in which country? So the U.S. some go to, but a lot of them, in one of the most special places in the world, go here. Is it Brazil, Cuba, Mexico, or Antarctica? That would be really cold going to Antarctica. It'd be very quite the journey across the Great Passage. It's not Antarctica. We're, we're eliminating that option. So let's see what our answer is first. Most of you got this Mexico. Everybody should look up the monarch butterflies in Mexico. I will send you that amazing YouTube link that Tracy uh, wanted to share from PBS. Uh, the monarch butterfly forest. I've had the chance to see them in person in my life. It's one of the most magical things in all of nature. Everybody should go to Mexico to go check that out in the winter. All right. Tracy, what's this do to our leaderboard? Groovy dog stays in the lead. Okay. So you go to question three. It's true or false? All bees live in colonies and hives. We've all seen those big, exactly pictures like this, like a whole bunch of bees together. Do they all do that? All 20,000 of them? Mm -hmm. We talked about a few different kinds of bees today. We shared a few pictures. This is something that a lot of people think, and a lot of people are wrong. So our answer is... Ooh, split 50 50. It is false. There are a lot of solitary bees. Tracy, in pretty much everyone's backyards, you have solitary bees, right? Like wherever we are across North America. That's correct. There's way more solitary bees than there is colony bees. Yes. They're special mm -hmm. ones. They're very cool too. I love colony bees. But if you go in your backyard and look at the flowers closely, a lot of the bees you see, solitary bees, not in a big group. That's a good lesson for today. Groovy Dog takes a big lead going to our final question. Okay, here we go. For all the marbles, true or false? Everyone can help by planting pollinator gardens at their home or school. This is a, I want all the answers in in like two seconds. Yes, get them in, get them in. We're not <laughs> trying to trick you. The answer is, it's, mm, what's the answer? Most of you have your answers in. Inexplicably, this one was 30 seconds because I pressed the wrong button. She had lots of time to ponder this as more of you come into the Kahoot. Now, Tracy, we've already got in our YouTube channel, like, we already have classes mentioning that they're doing this exact thing. They're naturalizing their gardens. They're planting these pollinator gardens. Like you guys are doing such a great job. And the answer, of course, is true. Yes, you can help. Um, one of the great joys of pollinator conservation is that everyone can take part. You know, 
it's a little harder to save elephants on a day-by-day -day basis if you're in Saskatchewan, but you can help native pollinators, which is an amazing thing. All right, great bobcat second. And was it a wire-to-wire win for Groovy Dog? It was. That's one of the first time one person has gotten every question right and won. So if you are a Groovy Dog, let us know who you are, and congratulations. <laughs> um, we're going to go to our Q&A now. Miss Fisher's class, I'm going to head to you guys first. If you want to come on in and take us away with a question, and then YouTubers, share all those questions. Get them in. We're going to take as many as we can over the next 12 right. minutes or so together. But hey, Miss Fisher. Hi. Uh, so we actually have a uh, school garden here that we started a few years ago, and the kids have been working on making a pollinator garden, and some of them noticed, we noticed ragweed in our pollinator garden last year, and it was really taking over, and we didn't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Ooh, good question. Yeah, so um, it's definitely um, going to irritate people who have allergies and things like that. So, you know, if you want to remove it, that's not a, a terrible thing, but... Um, it's wind pollinated, so that means that the insects aren't going to be visiting it. So um, it doesn't necessarily help the pollinators by keeping it. Great first question, guys. By the way, Ms. Fisher, keep bringing in more teachers. Like the more the merrier in the back. We'll have like a whole lineup of uh, every educator in the school. I love it. Um, uh, YouTubers, please chime in with some more questions. We just got one emailed to us about if there's anything that people are doing for the honeybee that they should be doing, or if it's different than for our natural or wild uh, solitary bees. Anything you is there? A, I guess the way we'll take the question is: Is there any difference between what people should be doing for honeybees and these colonial bees than there should be for solitary bees? Mm -hmm. So honeybees are obviously managed by the the hive owner, so they're always checking on them, making sure what they need. Sometimes they apply fungicides or different products to keep those bees healthy. Um, so they're pretty well taken care of. But I would just say that you know. Um, in, in certain place, situations like on farms and things like that, it's important for those people to notify the beekeepers where there's going to be spraying so that they can keep the bees away from that area. But as, a, as an individual, there's not much you can do for, for honeybees. Duly noted. Thank you so much for that. Um, a question that I knew you we were going to get, and I love it. Way to go. Uh, Ms. Coburn's class, our Dalewood School, wants to know if bees would have been affected by the eclipse. <laughs> Good question. Um... I think it's very similar to what humans would do because we have light receptors so they can sense light um, and they navigate by the sun. So when the sun goes down, if they, um, they don't want to be out when it's dark because then they'll get lost. And so they actually will settle down just like us and, and well, maybe not all of us and settle down and um, just kind of hide and just wait it out and um, find a nice, uh, quiet, safe spot to, to wait till the light comes back. I was going to say, I, like, I've been following the Eclipse stuff, obviously, very heavily, and I've heard a lot of people about dogs and cats and whatnot. I hadn't heard anything about bees, although on this note of navigating by the sun, everybody, when you're done this program, go look up the Waggle Dance, which is one of the coolest things in all of nature. <laughs> it's bees orienting by the sun to find food. It's like one of the freakiest things you'll ever learn. Once you've learned it, you'll never unlearn it. They'll tell everyone you know. It's like one of my, yeah, it's very, very yeah. cool. And the only thing I'd add, too, is it's like a weather system, right? If a big, huge black cloud starts moving in and we're going to get a huge thunderstorm and rain, the, the pollinators don't want to be stuck in that. They don't want to get hit by a drop of rain, which could actually kill them. So they're going to hide. <laughs> great context, too, because, I mean, of course, as it's like cool rain or, or hide inside, it's rain or take an umbrella for a bee. A drop of rain is as big as they are. That's a very dangerous event. It's like something you wouldn't go out and major baseball size hail. Uh, and the same applies <laughs> to something that's that small. YouTubers, there's so many questions all of a sudden. I'm going to take as many as I possibly can. Ms. Fisher, I am coming back to you live. Um, Stephen and Ms. Sawani's group said, do all pollinators make honey? No, no. Very few actually um, make honey in the sense that we think about with honeybees, like with mass quantities in a hive. Like they're taking their nectar and their pollen back to their babies in their, in their nests, um, but they don't produce honey the way we think of them. There's one species in um, South America that I was reading about. It's, um, I think they call it a sweet honeybee and it, it produces some kind of um, honey that the native people collect, but that's the only one that I know of that would produce honey like a honeybee. Interesting. Very cool. Uh, I guess counter to a lot of our students' expectations. Great question, Stephen. All right. <laughs> Daryl Smith wants to know how many eggs do bees typically lay? No pressure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't know the actual number, but it would vary by species, right? So some of the bigger bees would be able to produce more, smaller species would produce less. So highly variable depending on the species, but great question. Yeah. Ms. Fisher, we're going to come back to you guys for a minute, and then we're going to go back to some YouTube questions. I like these superlatives. If you can stump the scientists, that's always a joy. <laughs> Keep them coming with these tricky ones. Um, hey, Ms. Fisher, come on back in. Hi. Hi, we have Adriana. Hi, Adriana. How much, how much pollen do butterflies need to stay alive? Ooh. That is a great question. Um, I don't know the actual number, but I know that they have, to, like us, they have to eat and they have to get fat. So um, when they're leaving, for instance, like the monarchs, when they leave Canada, they have to eat enough food to keep them alive for six months. So if you think about their body weight and how much energy they would need over six months to go to Mexico, that gives you a sense of how much they have to eat. And it'd be just a tiny bit of nutrition in every nectar and every little drop of pollen. So, um, yeah, a fair bit. We uh, talked with James yesterday about bats and the fact that they can eat their own body weight, where it'd be the equivalent of like 180 hamburgers, which is way too many hamburgers. Don't ever eat that many hamburgers. And we've got the similar situation <laughs> with pollinators. Like, it's so much food um, that they have to do for these epic journeys. Imagine if you had to run around the world and you had to, like, pack your food with you to do that. That's not something that we're re pretty readily able to do. Um, mm -hmm. Although we do have that person on a broadcast. If anyone has done that feat, please come join us. Um, Tracy, great questions. They were ripping through these. Okay, Kanata Highlands, Ms. McDonald's class wants to know, what are cavity nests made out of? And if you could explain a little bit what cavity nests are for those who might not know. So that's where um, I was showing you like the stems where they're they're crawling inside a stem and they're like creating a little nest. So it could be all kinds of things like little fibers that they find. It's little bits of grass, um, little bits of fuzzy stuff, like anything that is sort of soft and malleable that they can carry. It's got to be super light. Um, and then they can go in there and they kind of move it around so that it supports the eggs in a, in a good way. So, and obviously they can't travel very far. So it has to be something, a material that they can find nearby. Yeah. Guys, you are killing it with these amazing questions. This is fantastic. And thank you for the detailed explanation, Tracy. That was marvelous. Um, all right, so many questions. Ms. Fisher, we will come back to you. We're going to take three or four more. Um, so this is related to the egg questions. This, uh, I guess, a little more specific for colony bees in Ms. Cop first class. Uh, how many can the queen lay at one time? So we've got a queen, maybe it's a honeybee. Uh, how many eggs is she laying? Do we know? Yeah, so we're if we're talking about bumblebees, then it's, it's not a huge amount, right? It's about like 20 to 30 eggs in a little colony. And of course, it's like all creatures, it depends how much nutrition they have, how much food they've been able to find uh, will determine how much they can, can lay. So, um, you know, a decent amount, but uh, yeah, not all depends endless. on the nature. <laughs> I'm surprised it's that low, actually. Like I would have thought it would be several hundred, maybe like low thousand, but like 20, 30 is pretty, that's unexpected. There you go. I you, you stumped me. There's a lot of stumping going around in general today in our CWF. <laughs> YouTubers, I'm going to take two more from you. I love that you're so keen. Do check out those resources I'll send at the end, and hopefully some of your questions are answered there. But you can always email us at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We're happy to track down answers for you. Uh, we'll take two more from there, and then we'll wrap up live with Miss Fisher. Um, Miss uh, the O'Byrne class wants to know if it's okay to plant plants that attract pollinators that aren't native. So they put in some plants, they're pretty sure they're not from there, but they're really, really, like hummingbirds absolutely adore them. Is that okay? Is there a recommendation you'd give for people that might want to do something a little different? What's your thoughts? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, assuming they're not invasive plants, so there's a whole group of plants that we call invasive. So definitely as long as they're not those ones, uh, pollinators will use other species that are not native. Um, but the reason that we really encourage the natives, and if, if, you can, if there's an opportunity to add more to your garden, it'd be a great, great time to add more native species, is there's also a whole group like a specialist, uh, for instance, specialist bees, who will only go to one species of flower or one group of flowers. Um, there's the generalists who will go to basically any flower that's in bloom, but by providing those native species, there's already that association. And so they are actively like the species of bees that would be found in our area are going to look for specific plants that grow in our area. So you're covering off the full spectrum of pollinators if you can provide right. native ones. Yeah. The, the more the merrier, the more native, no invasives uh, is a sort of general guideline. There's mm -hmm. some, um, okay, 
I'm going to be a rebel. I'm going to take two more YouTube questions. Miss Fisher, I am coming to you. I just love these questions. I think they're really, really important. Miss Cork wanted to know, does only the queen bee survive the winter, which is my mom's biggest question, uh, Tracy. So please uh, answer us. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. She, all the others are like, they're similar to honeybees in that respect. They have worker bees, but the queen is the one, only one that survives the winter. And so that's why it's also important, right, to her, her to be able to survive and come back and, and lay her eggs in the spring and finish that life cycle. So yeah. something else to, to mention too, like a lot of people are afraid of bees. Um, and so remember, there's all these native bees and they don't actually want to sting people because if they die, their their colony is dead and they won't reproduce any further so different than honeybees where you know one will sacrifice itself to save the the colony and so will sting but um native bees are not interested in doing that i'm so happy you mentioned that because we've actually it's like the longest we've ever gone into a bee program without mentioning that they're not something to fear so i appreciate that immensely we are actually with someone in ecuador the other day talking about sweat bees that mm -hmm. are just coming to like drink sweat off you and there's hundreds of them on your skin i've had sweat bees on me it's really weird but really cool at the same time so yes don't fear bees um mm -hmm. we get this question in every pollinator broadcast i think it's really important to have and then we're going to wrap up with miss fisher in just a minute but mr grell smith wants to know is there a place that you can go, and this is true anywhere in North America or beyond, where you can find out about native plants in the area? Is it the CWF website? Is it somewhere else you'd recommend? What can you share with us? Yeah, so we have all kinds of great resources on our website with the list of native plants. We have webinars that are going on. Uh, your local naturalist club actually will have uh, lists of native plants in your area. Um, there is a number of other associations like Native Plants of Ontario, um, uh, there's a North American Native Plant Society, so lots of really great places to find lists of different species. I will say too that unlike a lot of other things online, there really isn't a concerted effort to provide misinformation about this. So if you look up native plants for your area, a lot of the resources tend to be accurate. Um, there, there's no one really vested in me like, yes, plant a eucalyptus in Ontario right now. That doesn't tend to happen, so you're pretty in the clear if you find something online tends to be pretty good. The better the resource, obviously, like Canadian Wildlife Federation, the better you'll be. So great answer. Again, before we head to our last live class, National Wildlife Week, please do check out more on it. I'll be emailing all our registered classes with it. And if you want to check out and register for our other three broadcasts in this amazing series in the next two days, head to the link below. But let's wrap up with Ms. Fisher to say uh, one more question before we say goodbye. Hey. Hi there. We have John with a question. Hey. What do, what do they use their antennas for? Ooh, great question. Ooh, that's a good one. So that's like a sensory organ. It's kind of like our nose where we can sense what's going around. We can smell things. We can pick up um, light cues and things like that. So it's like another sense for them. It's such a... Like it's such a cool way of experiencing the world and we get to talk about this whether it's sharks or bats or bees i mean like humans are amazing in some of the senses we have we've got really great vision but the idea that you could experience the world in a whole different way and see different colors of light a lot of our pollinators see ultraviolet in a way that we don't so flowers look like these glowing beacons to them which is like basically black magic that's super super cool um Tracy, we could talk all day about this. This has been so, so much fun. Before we wrap up and say farewell, is there any last message you want to share about pollinators? Anything that you'd like to leave us with to say goodbye today? Uh, just again, to put on your bee glasses, get out in your, wherever there's flowers in your backyard, in a garden, a natural area, and, and look for all those little creatures that, that we don't often see and don't often pay attention to. And uh, you'll be amazed at the world of pollinators that are out there. Tracy, between you and Kaylee, I'm going to actually have to get a pair of bee glasses. I had a quick flag <laughs> from the broadcast the other day. So if I could just have like this array of, of eyewear, that would be magnificent. Um, thank you so, so much for joining. Your expertise, your passion about all this is so fantastic. Um, to our 1,100 kids, both live and after the fact, thank you all so much for tuning in. Hope you can join us for the rest of the programs. And we'll bring in Miss Fisher's class alive to say farewell. Anyone on YouTube, you can yell out in your class too. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day, guys. Bye.